The third Saiyan we ever saw in Dragon Ball, I believe, Goku and Gohan before him technically, but he was the first we identified as a true Saiyan. The battle armor, the scouter, the brutal attitude and lust for bloodshed, and those damn barbarian quads. If you're someone who likes Raditz or would have loved to see his character return, hit that like button and tell me in the comments what stories you would give to his character and if there's something you would have changed in the story we were given. Let's talk about impact a bit more. He arrives and makes Piccolo shake in fear. Big impact. Krillin at the time was actually a pretty solid fighter and with Raditz's tail alone, he smacks Krillin into the next dimension. Raditz makes the almighty Goku fall to his knees and then proceeds to take his son, Gohan, forcing Goku to pile up a bunch of bodies to join his team. Let me just tell you, for a guy just showing up, the stakes were pretty damn high. And this is where the writing for Raditz was one of the most interesting storylines ever. The teaming up of Goku and Piccolo, Dragon Ball's two biggest characters at the time, and we can all agree, that teamwork between them was so good. Words cannot describe it, the chemistry they had. But at the same time, their rivalry was still there. I'm gonna say this right now, and I don't care what anybody says. Goku and Piccolo working together during their intense rivalry was far more of a deal to me than Goku and Vegeta. And if you agree with that, leave the hashtag Goku Piccolo for the win. So thank you Raditz for that one and making the Scouters feel very important for the arcs they were meant to be a key item in. The way he blabbled on about numbers was great. Raditz's presence was obvious. He's trying to take Goku away from his loved ones to join the Saiyans. You see, Raditz was written so well that even in his short time on screen, you hated his guts. You loved to hate him. Raditz, in wrestling terms, was a true heel. He wasn't an annoying villain, one you didn't want to see or a character you had no time for. He was a piece of space trash and it was executed and written so well. He played his role so well. Well done Akira Toriyama. Raditz fulfilled his purpose, but unfortunately for him, that which you saw in Dragon Ball Z was his only purpose. A character to build the foundation of what was to come, to set the scene, for more concepts and story to follow. Raditz was there to kickstart the rest of Dragon Ball and that's all his character was used for. Because let's be honest, there were so many concepts and arcs coming up which had no place for Raditz. But Akira Toriyama, designing and introducing Raditz was a fresh move for Dragon Ball, bringing in the Space Warrior sci-fi field to Dragon Ball. Unfortunately, like I said, that was all he was made for. He's like the key to a treasure chest. Once you've got the treasure that is Vegeta, Frieza, Super Saiyans, etc., the key was no longer needed. A successful move, but when you think about it, at a massive cost to the character of Raditz. And that's where it's truly sad. It is such a shame. The bro of the main character should and deserve to be redeemed in a story arc for his weakness if you ask me. I would have absolutely loved for Raditz to have lived after the fight with Piccolo and Goku, only for him to realize Vegeta and Nappa are on their way to kill him as well for failing to recruit Kakarot, and the brothers must fight together. Imagine Raditz turning over a new leaf there, initially being forced to team up with his brother and Piccolo, or just Piccolo and Gohan, either one. Only for one year of training, Raditz would slowly grow towards Gohan, his nephew, and his ways begin to change after being exposed to the loving life on Earth. And then have a true rivalry, Raditz versus Vegeta, which could have been based on years of torment. Maybe then Raditz would have actually died against Vegeta, but it could have been a redemption arc for Raditz, fighting with his brother before he died, where Nappa and Vegeta just thought of him as a disgrace anyway. And that could have been an emotional death, starting to feel sorry for Raditz with the way he's been brought up and how he's lived. Oh, the possibilities are endless. I truly feel with more time with Goku on Earth, Raditz would have changed. I mean, look, Bardock and Gine and Goku, three out of four, had shown good attributes of character. Why is Raditz different? I'll tell you why. I strongly believe it was his upbringing and being around Vegeta and Nappa, tormented daily by them and also under the rule of Frieza having no chance but to obey. That would completely ruin a person like Raditz over 20 years who had lost his parents and brother. As a fan, I feel truly sorry for the character of Raditz, not because of what he'd done on screen as a bad man. Look, Vegeta was a bad man, get it? And he had more redemption arcs than anyone I can think of. Raditz the concept had so much more potential than what we saw. Sure, it served its purpose, but there would have been so much you could have done with Raditz in different arcs and stories. Heck, even a spin-off arc or a one-off movie. Why bring in Turles when you could have had a movie focusing on Raditz? Someone like Raditz being the only living member of Goku's family left, minus Gohan and that onwards, should have been way more of a focus in the main story as the brother of Goku. He was never revived, no, and maybe there was never an opening to do so, but I feel he deserved to be revived somehow and given a second chance. Or maybe in Goku's eyes, he was already given a second chance in that fight, but he blew it. 
The death of Raditz and his story ending wasn't the biggest insult to his character though. What made Raditz turn over in his grave was how he was rendered obsolete pretty darn quick. Think about it, Krillin, the guy he smacked with his tail unconscious, within one year destroys multiple Cybermen, Cybermen who were jokingly said to be the level of power of Raditz, each. Even Yamcha had what it took to wipe out a Cyberman, minus the obvious self-destruct but he did indeed have the power. Raditz and his power was made out to be worthless one year later, along with Vegeta and Nappa ruining his reputation without a care. One of the last remaining Saiyans, you would have thought they'd be pretty close to try and protect each other, but no, not these guys. To make matters worse, you know all those stupid idiot grunt soldiers of Freezer on Namek, the ones nobody care about, and even the ones who showed up on Earth later on and slaughtered by Trunks? Yeah, those clowns. Look how terrible they look. Look how worthless they are. Nobody cares about them. But now, they're all stronger than Raditz. Thank you, Power Levels. Raditz and his story made a huge impact, but after it made the impact, Raditz the character, brother of Goku, was wasted. Raditz is the one who stayed dead, and I can respect that from a story standpoint. Vegeta came back, Frieza came back, Android 17 came back, tons of characters come back. Heck, you could even say Boo came back as Oob if you wanted. So many redemptions, so many new stories, so many chances, but poor old brother of Goku, you're stuck in the Saiyan saga. But at least they had the balls to keep your character dead forever. Strengthening the consequence element to Dragon Ball rather than bring everyone back all the time. I like it for that part. But heck, even Nappa came back in GT for a moment. Of course he was humiliated, and I know we saw Raditz for a brief moment flying from hell, but there was nothing for him. How amazing would it have been if Raditz made a comeback, and he was much stronger, and talking like an ass pull level of power up like Android 17 got in Super, why the heck not? A new revamped Raditz versus anybody, take my money, but no, we know GT wouldn't give us that. And you know, I don't even expect Dragon Ball Super or any upcoming manga to give us any more Raditz. Things we all wanted to see with Raditz, Great Ape Raditz, Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 3, can you imagine Raditz with God Key? How awesome would that look? Sure, it would be effortless storytelling for the most part, but if you wanted to go the merchandise route, Raditz with new forms would have been a money maker, trust me. I think I read somewhere Raditz was the only member of his family initially determined to be a mid-class soldier, the rest were all low levels, that's pretty awesome potential for when it counted. We know Dragon Ball changed direction after that with that stuff though. But I'm going to end it on this. Raditz was an awesome villain, probably one of the best, and made a huge impact in the starting of Dragon Ball Z. It's thanks to Raditz, Dragon Ball Z had the momentum to push it even further beyond. But the fact that Raditz's story stopped after just a few episodes and only just a few chapters was criminal. After all the mockeries, all the jokes, all the revives, all the people wish back to life, all the second chances of guys like Frieza, Frieza mind you, if there's one character in the history of the entire Dragon Ball that deserved a chance at redemption properly after all his wrongdoing and suffering, a chance to be explored way more and develop his character on the levels that Vegeta and Piccolo had the chance to, if there's one character that deserved all of that, it was Raditz. The biggest misconceptions about Raditz is that he's a weakling or one of the weakest Saiyans to have ever lived. Being at a battle power around 1500 depending on which source material you read, Raditz's power is obviously nowhere near Vegeta, Nappa or any other Saiyan down the line, despite Raditz's initial introduction being a great deal stronger than his brother and main protagonist of the series, Son Goku. As we are all well aware, Raditz's Cyberman level of power was stopped dead in its tracks by Goku and Piccolo, and that was it. That was the memory of Raditz's power. And when looking at Dragon Ball Z overall, it's only natural to rank Raditz as the weakest Saiyan based on the Saiyans we see in the entire series from there on. But that's not entirely the full picture. Raditz for a Saiyan warrior was one of the strongest in terms of his potential and overall battle power at the time he was alive. He was already one of the 12 strongest Saiyans back when he was a kid and is only weak when we compare him to Nappa and Vegeta who were two of the strongest Saiyans of all time. Going with Minus, the Dragon Ball Super continuity, Bardock's fight with Gas proved Bardock was probably the strongest of all Saiyans when he died because Gas believed he was already far beyond every Saiyan. Gas knew of King Vegeta, who was meant to be the strongest, excluding Broly, which means at the time Bardock defeated Gas, he had no doubt surpassed King Vegeta. So as Bardock's sons, it makes sense why both Goku and Raditz should have some innate ability to be gifted. Saiyans are graded at birth based on their potential and power, either low class, middle class, or elite. 
where Goku, Bardock and Gine were ranked as low class Saiyans, but Raditz's power and potential were graded as a mid class Saiyan ranking, like Nappa. Mid class Saiyans had way better potential than any low class. By the point Raditz met Goku, despite all of Goku's accolades and training with the greatest on earth, Raditz already eclipsed him by at least three times. Very, very impressive. And in one of the guides, it says the average Saiyan power ranged between 400 and 900. Now, Raditz was an upper class Saiyan, which is not the same as latent potential grading, but more like an army rank. Bardock became an upper class warrior, but was still a low class Saiyan in terms of his potential grading, and Toriyama states that no matter if a Saiyan gets promoted from hard work or battle power rising, they will always be a low class Saiyan. So Bardock was in upper levels as a low class Saiyan, Raditz was in upper levels as a mid class Saiyan. Vegeta is an elite Saiyan but a prince, King Vegeta is an elite Saiyan but a king. It's a social hierarchy, king, prince, upper class, lower class. Raditz being referred to as a weakling was solely down to Raditz's power level being compared to Nappa's. Not that he's actually a weakling, ask Goku and Piccolo and Krillin. But that's where the misconception of Raditz being a weakling amongst the Saiyan race comes from. It's always been kind of a thing that supposedly the strongest of all Saiyans is the king. So as an example with Broly, if there's anyone to oppose the power of the Saiyan hierarchy, they had to be dealt with. King Vegeta was pretty much an asshole and so was his son. So if King Vegeta got wind of Bardock being superior to him, he would have a target on his back before long. When it comes to Bardock, it's probable that he was hiding his power because everybody kept assuming Bardock was weak because he was a low class warrior, but he kept surprising everybody to how powerful he was. In the Bardock special, Bardock was in a healing pod and it was noticed that his power was getting scarily close to King Vegeta's. Of course, the situation with Frieza changed the priorities and it's likely King Vegeta never knew or got wind of Bardock's potential and as such, his sons or at least at the time with Raditz, he was not considered a threat to the hierarchy. Goku being revealed as an alien was one of the best things to ever happen to his character in terms of development. When watching Goku in the original Dragon Ball, it was clear he wasn't like the others in terms of his potential. He was considered a fighting prodigy, but when Raditz showed up, it turned him into an underdog who was a product of his own merit. What Goku managed to do in a few years took his masters centuries to do. But even then, it was nothing compared to Raditz. Kakarot was definitely a weakling amongst the Saiyans to begin with, but him being the strongest Saiyan multiple times throughout Dragon Ball was very, very impactful. Another downplay of Raditz's power is when it's compared to the Cybermen. Raditz likely could wipe out groups of regular Cybermen by himself, and even if he was 1500, with the Earth Soil Cybermen were 1200, he could still deal with them all as long as they don't grab him, because a power level of 300 was a huge difference at that point. Raditz being a mid-class Saiyan similar to Nappa, where Raditz got to 1500 whilst Nappa was 4000, this could be justified. Nappa was much, much older than Raditz. So in comparison, if he's 20 years older than Raditz, 20 more years of the same type of growth that Raditz and Nappa had could have easily took Raditz to three to 4,000 as well. I know these are very low powers compared to the amount of power characters have now in Dragon Ball and how much they gain, but back then those increases of the 100s and thousands were considered a huge deal in growth. With Raditz's potential, could he have ascended to the levels of Goku now in Dragon Ball Super? Absolutely, if they wrote it that way, but also because Goku and Raditz are the same bloodline, where Raditz did have more potential than Goku. It's really about how you unlock and use that potential, rather than just being given a badge and that's it. Goku, despite being less potential at birth, found ways to grow outside of that tunnel vision scanning system. But there's no doubt, Raditz's same body could do the same or better given the same path, and mentors. And that's why Raditz has more potential than Kakarot, and is actually stronger than you thought as a Saiyan warrior. In order for Goku to overpower Vegeta in the beam struggle, Goku had to tap into a Kaioken times 4, where his times 3 seemingly appeared on equal ground to the Gallic Gun. The Kaioken times 4 was a massive gamble for Goku. He cashed in all of his chips in order to overpower that beam struggle, sacrificing his body's condition to raise his power. This was heavily implied when Yajirobe slapped Goku's back as a well done and Goku showed his pain and suffering from using the Kaioken times 4. Goku admits to Yajirobe that his body's messed up and basically his chance of winning had gone. Lord behold, Vegeta was still alive. Very important moment here to analyze. Vegeta is extremely angry. He's lost the plot. The reason why he's angry is because Goku's Kaioken times 4 surpassed his Gallic Gun. Now Vegeta does not know at this point that Goku cashed all of his chips in to perform that times 4. For Vegeta, he's absorbed in his anger and assumes Goku is currently that strength. But as we know, Goku admits that that stunt cost him greatly. Vegeta right now is thinking about what to do to triumph over a times 4, and the only way is an Uzaru multiplier of times 10, at the cost of reducing his energy to create the power ball, because there's no moon. But the Uzaru power would definitely triumph at times 4 Kaioken anyway when he transforms. So the initial dip is better for the overall cost of becoming an Uzaru. 
Now, just so we know, he only implies it's time to stop worrying about being pretty and that his ape form even terrifies him. It's a pride thing. He feels that he should not be tapping into this deep power to deal with a low-class Saiyan like Goku. Kakarot, I'm sorry, but now he has to. And it doesn't mean he's not allowed to do it. It's a legit move, but at the cost of Vegeta's pride. Totally following the rules here. He's never experienced a battle like this before, so Vegeta is forced to move out of his comfort zone. Now, the next few pages of the manga are critical. King Kai even states, or should I say the writing gives us a huge clue here, that Goku has no more strength left. And even without the 8th form, the Saiyan may be more than enough. And we could end this video right here because he is right. But we need to prove that is the case. Otherwise, this video doesn't form a solid foundation of argument. King Kai implies the only way to beat Vegeta is using the Genki Dama. That's the only way at this point of the fight. Vegeta is still in good condition here. But it's noticed his power went down in order to create the artificial moon. It's at this point that we will intervene in the story. If Vegeta never created that energy ball, his power would still be pretty dominant over the broken down Goku. Goku's body at this stage was not even capable of doing much, as soon in the next few pages, when Vegeta turned into Unuzaru, the only thing we saw Goku do was dodge, use a Kaioken to escape the ape, and then follow up with a solar flare. This is lackluster compared to how he fought moments earlier in the fight. Even Goku admits the only way to win is the Genki Dama. One last energy sphere. That's all he has left in the tank to perform. Now when Goku forms the Genki Dama, this is the best part, he admits it's using all of his remaining power to form it. He has nothing left. Now let's just assess this for one moment. Imagine Vegeta did not create the power ball and dip his energy and that he actually continued his assault against the broken down body of Goku. In a battle of attrition, there's a high chance he would have won through attrition anyway, just as King Kai said. Think about it, before Goku formed the spirit bomb, we saw him dodge, escape and use a solar flare, then showing that all he's got left is the juice to form a spirit bomb. Yes, only form it. Remember, it's not even his own energy. It's just forming it. There is no way the energy it takes for Goku to gather energy would even be capable of beating Vegeta in a battle of punches and kicks at this stage. Especially if Vegeta never dipped his power to make an energy ball. Remember, he only did that because he thought Goku was still as strong as a Kaioken times 4. Vegeta cannot read levels of power here in the story. He would not know Goku was weakened through key sensing. It's a legit argument. To further back this up, let's just assess Vegeta's remaining power compared to Goku's remaining power after the Kamehameha vs. Gallic Gun. For Goku, after dodging, using a solar flare and creating a spirit bomb, Goku then became useless in terms of battle. In terms of Vegeta, if he didn't utilize the Power Bolt to become a Great Ape, his power would not have dipped. Let's see what he was capable of after he formed the Power Ball and then became an Uzaru. After reverting back to his humanoid form and appearing somewhat drained, Vegeta was able to deck Krillin and Gohan with ease. He even put up a fight against a motivated Gohan, fired a barrage of key attacks, and then get hit with a damn spirit bomb. The secret attack that Goku and King Kai admitted was the only way left to win for Goku. Vegeta survived and got up, admitted he had strength left to deal with all of them, and then even blows up the battlefield until finally he starts admitting he needs to finish them off quick. And remember, this is a Vegeta after using the Power Ball and getting hit with a Spirit Bomb. He is in way better condition than Goku after Goku formed the Genki Dama, even after getting hit with it. Now, there are still doubters at this point thinking Goku would still kick Vegeta's ass if he didn't become a great ape, but let's play a little what if here. Where Vegeta did not reduce his power to become an Uzaru, he would fly down after the Gallic Gun Kamehameha battle, regain his composure, or still be angry, either one, both ways are bad for Goku. Goku appeared to have the energy to use the Kaioken for defensive purposes as well as a solar flare before using his remaining strength to form the spirit bomb. Now let's just say Goku would still be able to form a spirit bomb in some shape or form against regular Vegeta. Vegeta would then still spot Goku eventually in the same time if not faster because he's not a giant angry beast but instead and instead of blasting at Goku with a giant Uzaru blast, Vegeta would probably charge at Goku to try and stop him forming the spirit bomb. But Goku is incredibly accurate with the spirit bomb. He could hit a small moving target like Vegeta as demonstrated when training on King Kai's planet. Okay, Vegeta could dodge the bomb, but let's give Goku an advantage here and say Goku hit the spirit bomb on Vegeta. Congratulations, Goku. Not only have you rendered yourself useless and nothing left in the tank now after forming the bomb, but what good would it do if it hit Vegeta anyway? 
he survived in the original story with strength to spare. And in this what if, his power is even higher because he didn't form the power ball or have to fight off Gohan and Krillin. In fact, this outright proves that if Vegeta did not become a great ape and kept on the offense, even if Goku resorted to his last card of the Spirit Bomb and succeeded with a hit, Vegeta would have won this fight anyway, using his remaining strength to beat on Goku's empty vessel harder than Raditz did to Goku earlier in the arc. In fact, without becoming an Uzaru, Gohan or Krillin would not have felt an extraordinary surge in power to stop and then head back to help Goku. Without the backup from Gohan and Krillin, Vegeta would have pounded Goku's key empty body into the dirt, punch after punch, until eventually he would kill him in cold blood, the Saiyan way. And to further add to the charm of Vegeta, even after Vegeta admitted he needed rest in the original story, he then found enough tenacity to take a hit from Uzaru Gohan and form an energy disc to take it out. That was the final straw before Vegeta was actually rendered useless even after the spirit bomb hit. This guy was a machine. He would not stop. In conclusion, after the Kamehameha vs. Gallic Gun, Vegeta had way more left in the tank, where it only took a few dodges and four minute Genki Dama for Goku to openly admit he had nothing left. He got off one last key blast to great ape Vegeta's eye, but even then he said he could no longer move his upper body. That was it. Vegeta, on the other hand, should have kept to his game and, and cashed in all his chips to continue fighting Goku normal. If only he kept his composure. Vegeta's anger defeated him and put him in a downward spiral in that battle. But Vegeta did have what it took to beat Goku anyway. Much better condition to beat Goku than many people would believe. I'm not even going to mention Yajirobe on the battlefield. If Vegeta didn't form the Power Ball and kept attacking Goku anyway, Yajirobe would have been swatted like a fly. To solidify this titanic argument, Right at the end of this fight, before Vegeta gets away, Goku admits Vegeta was so far above him and he was shocked and scared about it. In no shape or form did Goku say, I would have beaten him if he didn't turn into an ape. No, Vegeta without the Uzaru would have beaten Goku anyway. Goku had to sacrifice his body on so many levels to be able to keep up with Vegeta, but his body failed him massively before Vegeta was even close to being truly defeated. The Genki Dama did not defeat Vegeta in the original story, and it would not defeat an even stronger Vegeta if he did not form the artificial moon. Goku would have died by Vegeta's hands. Then Vegeta would have tracked down and killed Gohan and Krillin anyway. You could say, the fact Vegeta went Uzaru actually protected the planet in terms of everything that happened after that. People enjoy downplaying Vegeta in this fight, calling him a cheater for using the Uzaru and wanking off Goku's Kaioken times 3 and times 4, but don't even put up a decent argument and forget to understand the cost of using those techniques. He would have beat Goku's weakened ass. Vegeta was a badass and probably the toughest guy Goku ever fought in battle. After everything thrown at him, he refused to die and kept coming back for more, like a damn Saiyan Terminator. Now, with the Saiyans, could they have stopped Freezer if they worked together before the events of the Bardock special and even before the events of the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie? Of course, I'm going to be talking about this through a theoretical power versus power standpoint as well, because if we think about the events of the Bardock special, Freezer dropped his energy ball onto planet Vegeta, and let's say all of the Saiyans joined forces and launched an almighty combined blast to deflect the bomb. The chances that Freezer would just launch another one after that is highly likely because he would then continue to see the Saiyans as an even bigger threat standing up for themselves. And if that next energy ball failed, let's be honest, he could easily hit his second form and launch an even greater level of power to wipe them all out. That is, if the Saiyans aren't already tired out after trying to deflect the balls. That's how Freezer rolls. He destroys everything around him, including planets, and he can live in space. It's a cop-out, but there you go, it's Freezer. The scenario is basically the same in the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie. Frieza believed it was best to put the sleeping beast down before they could get awakened. He feared that they would rebel against him one day, being the warrior race that they are and always growing stronger. But let's think about this from a Dragon Ball cinematic perspective and imagine an actual battle happened. Base form Frieza arrives on planet Vegeta or anywhere else after he initially took over the Saiyans and the planet. However, something has changed. In this scenario, let's say the Saiyans had a gut feeling that Frieza would eventually turn on them, so they rallied their warriors for battle. Now, we have to remember, the majority of these Saiyans could said to be under the 10,000 mark in terms of power. I remember in the Broly movie, the Saiyans who were targeting Frieza were detected to have power levels of 2,000, which caught Frieza's eye. So let's imagine a perfect scenario. Pretty much a whole army of Saiyans surrounded Frieza on some other planet. 
lured him in, and there's a full moon. They all transform. So we have base form Freezer versus hundreds of great apes with battle powers ranging between 20,000 to 100,000. Heck, even put Vegeta and his father amongst them too, and we have some pretty extra beefy power levels to cause damage. Now let's think about the logistics of this fight. Think about how much room hundreds of great apes would take up. How would they even be able to move around each other to hit something as small as Freezer? They would literally crash into each other, especially if some have no control over their rationale. Even an army of great apes could cause as much harm to themselves as they're trying to cause to Freezer. Now with Freezer, being in full control of his senses, still has an extremely high power in his base form over 500,000, which is truly above any great ape. Combine that with his speed, this guy will outmove all of those great apes, fly high above them, cause damage, and will probably be swift enough to death beam each of them one by one in a matter of seconds because he's nearly 10 times stronger than most of them. Just look how well Goku did against Berta and Jace in his base form. Not only that, his energy balls would probably be strong enough to cause serious damage to most of them in groups. I don't think I see any Uzaro being able to jump up high and hit a super nimble freezer if I'm honest. It would be like an Ascended Trunks versus Perfect Cell, probably much worse than that. In terms of raw power, sure, the apes collectively have the edge here unless Freezer is in his final form. Think about it. An average great ape, let's say is 20,000. Multiply that by, heck, let's say a thousand apes, and we only come to 20 million, and that's not even 50% final form Freezer. And that's collectively with the great apes if they all work together, which is not going to happen, guys, let's be honest. They're going crazy. And another problem is these Saiyans are not going to be as in tune as someone like Android 17 and 18 working together. In their great ape forms, all they want to do is crush the enemy. Or probably fight it out amongst themselves because they're barbaric. Now, let's say Freezer went into his second form. That alone would be enough to kill all the apes one by one anyway. Third form would be an overkill. No ape would be able to touch him. And if Freezer is crafty enough to fly up high or hide or transform to full power, this guy is winning in battle situations. Heck, Freezer is smart. He would probably destroy the moon anyway, reverting the great apes back, unless Vegeta or someone else used the artificial moon, which Freezer again would destroy that anyway with his lightning speed. Freezer would have no need to use his army in this fight either. If they did get involved, they still have a lot of heavy firepower to attack the great apes. Think about it. Zabon could probably take out an average great ape by himself. The Saiyans were royally screwed even in perfect situation battle circumstances, and that's with just Freezer having a presence. If it didn't get to a battle, Freezer would just probably obliterate them as a whole. But let's say some lucky circumstances happened. The Great Apes managed to give base form Freezer a few cheeky slaps mid-air until the King Vegeta and his son managed to beefy bum drop onto Freezer's base form and squash him so he couldn't move. Then, and only then, can I see the Saiyans performing any sort of damage to base form Freezer before he could transform. It's a pretty slim turn of events. But the only way to stop Freezer would be to slap him down and quickly pummel him. But with multiple apes, could their combined fists even hit him? He could probably tank hits multiple times because he's 10 times stronger than him in raw power. I just don't see any scenario where even the combined Saiyan Assault could beat Freezer with the level of power they had. Maybe if Freezer didn't destroy Planet Vegeta when he did, give the Saiyans another year or two to grow, then they perform the attack. Maybe their growth then could stop Freezer, but they would all have to be in on the deal together. They would have to be motivated enough, all of them, to stand up to the tyrant and not be scared. Which leads me to the other main reason why the Saiyans didn't rebel sooner or couldn't, and that's fear. If we remember the Bardock special, most Saiyans didn't believe Bardock. And if you took any individual Saiyan out, they would obviously be submissive to Freeze's reign because they feared him in terms of power. So they were probably too scared individually to stand up for themselves, and Bardock was not persuasive enough to bring them all to their senses in time. Unless all Saiyans at the exact same time came to their senses and decided, we are going to do this. Otherwise there would be no fighting chance at all, because it's an instinct. To see a tyrant of that power and being powerless to stop him, a handful of Saiyans are not going to make a difference. You literally need a speech from Mel Gibson from Braveheart to stay in the fight, and a lot more. And it would always be solid for Saiyans to plot any sort of rebel against Freezer anyway. Think about it. The scouters they had always transmitted to Freezer. And I'm sure the Freezer Force always had their eyes on the Saiyans anyway, wherever they go. But I just want to know your thoughts, guys. Do you think if the Saiyans plotted against Freezer back in the day, and in the perfect circumstances with a full moon, loads of great apes, could the Saiyans have had a fight in chance, or was Freezer always in control? I remember Freezer wiped the floor with King Vegeta's assault in Dragon Ball Z and I remember him blitzing multiple sniper power levels of 2000 with ease in the Broly movie. I personally feel the Saiyans were screwed no matter how much you look at it, no matter which way we look at it. They would all have to be Super Saiyans to even stand a chance.
Does King Cold have a final form and would that have been strong enough to defeat Super Saiyan Future Trunks or Goku on Earth if the story allowed that battle to take place at full power? You see when Future Trunks arrived and made one of the greatest entrances in anime and manga history, King Cold and Frieza were simply there to help portray how powerful Super Saiyan Trunks was. Frieza was done and dusted and the story had to move on from Frieza to the androids. But one of the biggest disappointments I felt was that I never got to see King Cold go all out in combat or even get one decent fight. For someone like Frieza's father, the guy who taught Frieza the ropes, who led the Empire and looked far more intimidating in terms of his design and size, to think that he wasn't even in his final form is something that has been pretty much on everyone's minds since King Cold's appearance. Well in this video I'm going to share some official material with you that actually suggests King Cold was more of a threat than what we saw. Of course plot is plot but King Cold transforming further is definitely something that could have happened within Dragon Ball. And I will share with you the material right now. I found information in the Japanese Dragon Ball Z Volume 1 Dragon Ball Box Dragon Book and it says... A Frieza flavor that has been ravaging the entire universe, repeatedly destroying and looting. Frieza's biological father, King Cold, reigns supreme. He believes that the one with the most power in the universe must belong to his clan. But he is a shadowy figure in the organization. And other than Frieza, his existence is known only to a few of his closest aides. Its appearance closely resembles Frieza's second form, and Cold seems to be the type to improve his abilities by transforming himself. I had confirmed this information with Herms98 over on Twitter and he said it's true. He confirmed in Japanese it says King Cole looks like Frieza's second form and apparently increases his abilities by transforming. That fits perfectly with him looking like second form Frieza. And what's the reason he uses that form? Is it to declare dominance when in front of others due to the size? Or simply it's a design choice never expanded further upon in the actual story, which is the most obvious answer, let's be honest. But still, to think that King Cold could transform transform further. This could have been really problematic post Yadrat for Goku and Trunks. Now for the purpose of this video, let's assume he could transform into the same final form as Frieza at the very least. An in-universe answer as to why he was defeated so swiftly was because of his arrogance and of course Trunks giving him no time to grow further. Obviously the anime is more dramatic when fighting Mecha Frieza but the manga has Trunks go in very quickly. To be honest, it's highly likely Trunks' full attention in both anime and manga was to neutralize the threat without letting the threat get worse. That's just how Trunks rolls. So King Cold would have never been able to transform against someone like Trunks or even a Goku in the future timeline that wasn't taking any more chances after Namek. So the only way we can have King Cold transform is just in a hypothetical situation to see how strong he really would be because I can't see him transforming before going to Earth for multiple reasons. One of them being his relaxed overconfident nature until he sees the Super Saiyan with his own eyes. So how strong would King Cold become if we're going with him being in his second form? Well, we can use similar jumps in power that Frieza had from his second form to final form on Namek, and that's easy to work out. 100% final form Frieza on Namek had a power level of 120 million. 1% of Frieza's power on Namek would be 1.2 million. Interestingly enough, that is actually close to Frieza's second form. So when looking at Frieza's total power overall, second form Frieza only generates about 1% of Frieza's overall power. In the anime, there's a mention of Frieza using 1% against Goku, but that doesn't even work correctly as that would actually be 1.2 million versus Goku's 3 million, and Frieza was doing way better than that level even before his power up to 50%. Okay, so as we know, when Frieza came to Earth as Mecha Frieza, he wasn't in his 100% form, but more reliably at 50% or even less. Even Trunks insinuated Frieza was half strength. The writer had him acknowledge his own power by suggesting he could probably beat Super Saiyan Goku now. Obviously, Frieza only experienced Goku's power on Namek through combat, which he knows was doing better than him. So gauging himself against Goku's power that he fought suggests Frieza has improved to around 150 million at maximum power, making his 50% form 75 million compared to his 60 million on Namek. That's an acceptable power up as Mecha Frieza, seeing as it was also stated he grew stronger. Now King Cold in his second form was being sensed by the others and compared to Frieza. Krillin had only ever sensed 50% Frieza on Namek and stated King Cold was around the same, and that would mean Mecha Frieza had arrived at 60 million, similar to Namek. That would make
make him actually at 40% power on Earth. But you can use whatever mental gymnastics you want. I see it that way. Gohan said the feeling of Trunks' Super Saiyan power was similar to his dad's, but I interpret that as it's the same type of energy, a Super Saiyan's energy, not necessarily the exact same level of power. Even King Kai implied Trunks is stronger than Goku on Namek. As Trunks dealing with King Cold and Freezer at the same time was a far better performance than Goku fighting Freezer alone on Namek. But to make this easy, Gage and Trunks is simple. Freezer launched an energy blast at him and it made contact. Trunks had tanked it without any damage. With energy blasts raising power up to multiple times, the Kamehameha raising Goku's power by 2.2 times in the story and even more depending on how long he charges it. For a basic energy blast, we can go with 1.5 times Freezer's power that Trunks successfully tanked. It's been officially stated in the Daisenshu, to negate damage you need to emit two times the power of the opposing energy. Trunks stood still, so his bog standard Super Saiyan is at least two times the 90 million at bare minimum. So potentially Trunks is at 180 million and still above a theoretical 100% Mecha Freezer. And I think this is a good number because it means he's stronger than Namek Super Saiyan Goku, but he's also not mountain stronger, so if Gohan did compare Trunks to Goku, then it's a bit more reasonable. Again, Trunks could still be way higher. Interestingly, Freezer's second attack on Trunks made Trunks put effort in to negate it. It actually pushed him back somewhat. This was a very strong energy blast by Freezer. 180 million is fine for Trunks. When Goku arrives, his new level of Super Saiyan is able to finger block Trunks' attacks. Although Goku said Trunks didn't put his heart into it, if he did, Goku would then maybe use, what, two fingers? Both hands? What I'm saying is, Goku would still stomp Trunks if both went all out. So I think the gap between Super Saiyan Trunks and Namek Goku can be applied here somewhat. Between Trunks and post Yardrat Super Saiyan Goku. Potentially making Goku around 210 million. That's my head canon based on what I'm seeing in the show. But if you've got another way to work it out guys let me know in the comments below. Anyway let's get back to King Cold and wrap this up. If second form King Cold is around 60 million then the difference between second form and 100% final form presuming he could do that form would be a 100 times increase based on the calculations we made earlier. Making 100% King Cold 6 billion or just 3 billion if you wanted to play around with 50%. That is quite frightening. This guy is chewing his way through the Android Saga. Goku and Trunks could attack him together at that level of power and they would get crushed. How strong could King Cold really be if this is the case? What if he trained? We know the growth rate of the Freezer race. Screw Resurrection F. Give us Resurrection C for Cold. But you guys let me know in the comment section about what you think about the material source here and a world where King Cold reigns supreme. Just how far could he actually go? I think it's fair to say if Toriyama wanted to, he could have made King Cold kill everyone in verse using a potential fire final form and that would all make sense but that's not how stories work unfortunately. Stories require drama, excitement and the good guys protected through plot and ultimately it's whatever the writer wants. So King Cold going final form and killing everyone would never happen as a decision in writing but it could happen in the Dragon Ball universe. There's the difference and that's how strong King Cold could very well be going on that material source. Pretty awesome. Apul is one of the most important characters in Dragon Ball history and today we're going to look at 10 reasons why he is above Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta from the Broly movie, above Beast Gohan from the Beast Gohan movie, and also 10 reasons why he's going to be the next Grand Priest and may even have no limits. Please hashtag justice for Apul in the comment section and spread the word of one of the biggest threats to the Frieza saga in the Frieza saga. Also hit that like button if you're a fan of Apul and also hit that like button if you're not a fan of Apul, but definitely subscribe if you're here on this video now. Now Apul is one of Dragon Ball Z's main antagonists and is labeled a mid-ranking soldier in Frieza's army because they feared his potential and tried to keep him down. A warrior without spirit might as well be dead. Zabon, Dodoria and Completed Ultra Instinct, I mean Kui, would be by Frieza's side but Apul would run solo, showcasing his inner strength. So why is Apul stronger than Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta, Pui Pui Goku, I mean Perfected Ultra Instinct Goku and Beast Gohan? Why is he going to dethrone the Grand Priest in the next Dragon Ball Super arc with the credentials he has? Let's take a look. Number 10. Immediately being introduced as a powerhouse, a pool's power already toppled everyone in classic Dragon Ball at that point, and he could one-shot them all. A pool essentially one-shots an entire franchise, that being a franchise with the most respect and love, the original Dragon Ball. And not only that, but he could also one-shot early Dragon Ball Z, including Raditz and Nappa. His power was far greater right from the start than what Goku could ever achieve of in 200 episodes with a Dragon Ball. So already has potential far above Goku and even the future 
conclusion results. Number nine, a pool is a purple alien with some yellow spots and his name is based on Apple. Now an apple a day keeps Dr. Giro away, meaning a pool is already stronger than the entire Red Ribbon army and that includes Cell and Cell Max. And this is only Namek Saga a pool. They can wish him back later on. Number eight, now a pool makes a cameo appearance in GT able to escape hell and because GT happens after Super, the official Shueisha timeline of Dragon Ball shows it. And a pool happens after Gogeta Blue, and that means he's stronger. Number seven, a pool was handpicked for the secret mission on Namek to search for the Namekian Dragon Balls. He takes on the Namekians after his squad fails him. A pool becomes a survivor at Moore's village. A pool is able to take down Namekians with ease, despite his power being stated to be below that of the Namekians. That is officially stated in the Daisenshu, by the way. So it proves no matter if a pool is physically weaker than Gogeta Blue, he can still win. This is a very powerful feat. Number six, he is the most reliable to keep tabs on Vegeta, and courageously enough to keep near Vegeta during his recovery whilst he's about to gain a Zenkai boost. A pool gets a courage boost, and that multiplier is higher than fusion, so could deal with Gogeta Blue mid-difficulty at this point. Courage is part of key, as officially stated by Akira Toriyama. A pool has a lot of it. Number five, a pool only died because he lowered his power down to one and allowed Vegeta to kill him so he could continue getting stronger in hell, and be trained by the best instructors in hell, already meaning he has more raw potential than Beast Gohan, and has a lot of experience to take the throne instead of the Grand Priest in Dragon Ball Super Part 2. Another fun fact, when the Freezer Force arrives on Namek, a pool is the only Freezer Force character never shown wearing a scouter. He doesn't need a scouter when Zarbon and Dodoria, and even Freezer heavily relied on the scouters, meaning a pool was sensing power before Gogeta ever did. He has way more experience, and can potentially sense God Key in the Namek Saga. Number 4, Captain Ginyu is a pool's instructor, and therefore a pool knows change, and can easily change bodies with Beast Gohan or the Grand Priest if things get rough on that throne and there's a power struggle. But it would never come to that. A pool has a lot of confidence in himself after the post-Hell training arc. Number three, a pool's power level is 6,000 in Gekishin Freezer. It ranges from 1,500 to 1,700 in Super Saiyan Densetsu and is 1,520 in Goku Gekitoden. But as we know, power levels don't matter, which is another reason why he's going to be the Grand Priest in future Dragon Ball Z arcs. In a pool's biography in Budokai Tenkai G3, it states it was he, not Zabon, who defeated an injured Vegeta, who had a power level of 24,000. As we all know, Budokai Tenkai G3 is canon, and the anime and manga aren't real. So as we can see, even in official material, they tried to cover up a pool's potential constantly, trying to downplay him, so it's only reliable to go with the fact he was removed from Z because they feared him, making him stronger than Kui Goku and Pui Pui Goku, as no one fears him. Number two, despite being in only five episodes, he has six different voice actors in the dub, three in the Funimation and three in Ocean Dub. The Chad has more dub voice actors than the number of appearances he makes. People want to be like a pool. They want to have that role. He's a bigger role model and influence than Vegito. And he's far more likable than Whis. Number two, again, darker pool. And finally, number one, the number one reason why a pool is above Zeno, because being this apparent job a character that he's made out to be, he's obviously made it into every Dragon Ball game. He is a serious threat in the Dragon Ball Legends mobile game and even has his own sub-story in Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. He's in more video games than MUI Goku, Gogeta, the Blue Beast Gohan Grand Priest combined, meaning that the fans want him more than all those. So as you can see, Apul clearly has what it takes to fit the role of Grand Priest. Let me know in the comments what I missed, add any feats or fun facts about Apul. I'm sure there's more out there. And don't forget to hashtag justice for Apul. Albeit their appearance are of small young humans, we quickly find out that it was their biological enhancements that had 18 triumph over the new Super Saiyan Vegeta, clearly outpacing him in terms of last ability in a fight, and it was all down to her energy supply. In Dragon Ball Chapter Manga 365, Bulma stated while looking at 17's blueprint that he was human-based, but just about everything has been enhanced with bio-organic components. Dragon Ball Super reaffirms this, that the androids have been modified on a cellular level to be superhuman, although 17 and 18 are called androids. Their actual scientific biology makes them somewhat different. They are the first of their kind to be entirely reconstructed at the cellular level thanks to biotech and genetic science. And when we say cellular level, this goes beyond skeletal systems. This is right down, literally, to the cell. Their power comes from an internal energy reactor within their bodies, which provides them with an endless supply of energy. But either way, this energy is not key, where key is wielded by other fighters like Goku or Vegeta to create energy. 
This is also supported in Z when Trunks explains that the androids have infinite energy and doesn't refer to key. Also, it's worth noting 17 and 18 can still train and become stronger, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In the Dragon Ball question and answer section in the Dragon Ball Full Color Android Saga volume, it's mentioned that they age much slower due to the artificial cells in their body. But what confuses me is that even if they can train and get stronger, like other humans such as Krillin and Yamcha, then why doesn't their key increase when they train? Why does their energy go up but not their key? Maybe battle power isn't key at the root. Maybe key creates energy. Maybe there are tons of different ways to create energy. It seems that they do not have key even if they trained or fought battles, and their key doesn't grow. Maybe their physical body durability improves, but they do indeed get stronger as time goes on in Dragon Ball Super, especially 17. I mean, a guy who was barely in perfect cell level, suddenly Super Saiyan Blue level in Super after so many years, Piccolo believes the androids are the best for the fight because they have no chi. Well, the androids have gotten stronger because their energy has increased, not their ki. But what's creating the energy? 17 and 18 are bio-organic. And maybe it's because 17's mutation, his genetic mutation has evolved and made him stronger, and his bioness, so to speak, enhances the level of external bioenergy he can put out. So not really key creating energy, but bioenergy. All of his android barriers and key blasts. That could be bioenergy. Kind of like the real life stuff that is renewable energy to sustain itself. Bioenergy. And this really is a solid approach to linking androids key, sorry, androids energy, to renewable energy. It makes sense as to who they are and how they can keep on going and going and going without needing other fuel. But in a statement for the Universe Survival Saga, Akira Toriyama noted that 17 has great potential, and this could mean that his bio-organic self evolves over time to give him significant increases in physical welfare. So again, if I had to dissect this in my own opinion, why don't the androids' key ever increase even though they train? It's because they still have human traits, but now they are actually bio-organic and that means at a cellular level. They are not technically pure human anymore or pure machine. Think of Mass Effect. They are just something completely else. And whenever they train, their bio-organic nature creates energy in a new way through their genetics and not through the control of key. Yes, they are modified humans, but this doesn't mean that they are still regular humans anymore. Just think of Saiyans. They are humanoid have exact human-like features, but at a cellular level, they have Saiyan DNA that makes their Zenkai boosts take place. Their genetics allow them to benefit from battles more than humans. And this is just like androids, but instead of being Saiyans, they are bio-organic through science. Now, there may have been some episodes or material saying that the androids do have infinite key, but based on the latest manga, infinite key doesn't exactly sit well with what is said. Instead, infinite energy makes a lot more sense. And just in relation as to why the androids can't provide infinite energy to the spirit bomb, it's a simple one that doesn't need massive discussion. Basically, the spirit bomb requires Genki and not actual ki or energy used in battle. Genki is more of a spiritual energy which actually comes from all living things. And the Genki from 17 and 18 is probably just the same as any other character in Dragon Ball or any other human. It's their life essence, so to speak. But do 17 and 18 get weaker? I would say yes. And that's through being damaged. If you remember Piccolo vs. 17, the battle was so close all of the way through, and both kept fighting thinking they would win. Piccolo was winning in terms of strength and durability, but 17 was winning through speed and stamina. And why was 17 looking battle worn? It's because 17 and 18 are not invincible. They are not immortal. 17 and 18 are bioorganic and can still be hurt. Imagine this, if one of us got our arms broken in the middle of a fight or pull a hamstring, we are damaged and we can't focus our energy as well and our pathways of energy and flow of power are severed. I believe this is what was happening to 17 and why Piccolo was wearing 17's power down so Piccolo could withstand the punches. And the same goes for 17 vs. Jiren in the final part of the Tournament of Power. 17 took a huge beat in through the tournament, and this must have affected his channeling of energy through damage alone to his physical body. Does he still have infinite energy? Yes, but I believe his energy output was severed and made weaker overall due to the damage. It's something to think about and makes a lot more sense. Like I said, 17 is not invincible. He's mortal. It's just incredibly shocking how much of a jump a regular citizen could have in order to basically match a Super Namekian who was already above a Super Saiyan. I mean, 
Everyone loves multipliers and numbers, so we're going to do that here. And although androids don't have energy that can be sensed, it's still fun to think of the power increase in its own right. And you could look at it like this. You could make your own multiplier from the Android upgrade. If we consider 17, before he was an Android, to have a basic power level of 5. Farmer with a shotgun level, right? Human male. Farmers are tough guys. They lift all day too. And 17 was a young man. So let's just go with 5. Now, even if we went with Goku's Super Saiyan power level on Namek, 150 million, we know Android 17 was way beyond that power. But let's use that as a massive low ball. 150 million divided by 5 gives us a 30 million multiplier as an Android upgrade. Seeing as 17 was a regular citizen beforehand. It's absolutely insane how the modification made one's power jump to beyond that amount. You could even say Super Namek in Piccolo is 10 times that of Goku on Namek at least. We're looking into the multipliers of 30 to 300 million. I'm sorry, but that completely blows a 50 times Super Saiyan multiplier out of the water. The same goes for Android 18, but on a less scale because it's always been hinted 17 was the stronger, but for 17 to reach Super Saiyan Blue levels in Dragon Ball Super, as broken as that seems for a guy literally spending years just looking after some animals, you you can't tell me he was training intensely all those years after Cell. Otherwise, everyone on Earth, including Dende, would have felt the force of explosions in that. Unless he fought Cell Juniors for 10 years straight. Dragon Ball Super Bonus Chapter. To make the most sense out of this, we can easily presume Android 17 passively gets stronger as time goes on just by his design and upgrade alone. Meaning, there's no limit to his power. He's constantly gaining power. And that's scary. To think this guy is an Earthling and he gets that much of a boost through science. Humans and science, man, I tell you, it's scary. But let's say the Android upgrade is a multiplier in itself. Imagine sticking a 30 million Android multiplier on the likes of Master Roshi, who has a power level of over 100 to begin with. The amplifications that has on the power already there, Roshi could have squashed Perfect Cell if we consider the Android upgrade as a multiplier. But even Android 16, let's talk about him for a second. Dr. Jiro built this guy from nothing. No Earthling to begin with through basic power parts and equipment, we had a character at Imperfect Cell's level. Now a machine that was even confident he could destroy Perfect Cell with his own bomb, the bomb in itself, this is an insane amount of equipment from Dr. Jiro, if that is true. It would make sense though, right? Dr. Jiro made Cell, he knew he was meant to absorb the android, so obviously had it in his design plans and knew where his strength would go. Of course, Dr. Jiro's bombs were good enough to deal with his own creations. And then Cell as well. The creation in itself is incredible through genetics and biomodification. Look, all I want to say is that if invaders were going to attack Earth, Dr. Jiro could hold off anyone if he's given the time to invent. Tell me, how strong would Dr. Jiro's Android upgrade be on someone like Goku? Any version of Goku you want. Jiro's potential in terms of a scientist is unlimited based on what we've seen and based on how the story and narrative pushes his character. How far do they think Dr. Jiro's science could take a fighter? If he learned about gods and that, what's the strongest fighter or machine he could build and how strong could a theoretical Goku in the Tournament of Power be if he was modified? Even Goku in the Android Saga, if Dr. Jiro sneakily went and kidnapped Goku's recovering body after the heart attack, operated on him, how strong would a Super Saiyan Android Goku be, guys? Comment below. Personally, I feel like we're talking about, based on alone, how Android 17 passively grows to blue levels, living with some cows and beavers, after being a normal citizen with an insignificant power level. Goku, with an Android amp in the Android saga alone. If I'm honest, he's taking on Moro, Beerus, Jiren, Broly, all at the same time. Goku would have unlimited stamina, he could have Super Saiyan, then have Kaioken on top, never running out of juice. Cell was introduced in Dragon Ball Z with such an incredibly terrifying build-up. I had chills when he was in his creepiest form, murdering and absorbing the humans in Ginger Town. But despite how awesome and interesting Cell's journey of absorbing the androids was, and how astonishingly powerful he was becoming throughout the entire saga, no matter how powerful he was, how many tricks he had up his sleeve, how much knowledge he had, how much experience, how many skills, how many of the other fighter cells to enhance his being, what really secured Perfect Cell's ultimate defeat was not fully Gohan. Gohan was the fighter that pulled the trigger and killed Cell, yes. But to get to that point of destruction, there were many moments in the story in which Cell sealed his own fate. And Dr. Jiro was equally responsible. Cell was the one who indirectly, probably without even realizing, picked up that gun and held it to his own head where Gohan could pull the trigger. In this video, we are going to look at the psychology of Cell and analyze just why Dr. Jiro's own design strengths for Cell to have all of the greatest fighter cells were in fact Cell's greatest weakness. 
In the manga, cells being compromises of the following fighters, which are primarily the ones I will focus on today, that being Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, Frieza, and King Cold. Some may debate other cells were inside him like Tien's and Krillin's, and maybe so, but all I remember are the first five. But for a being to have Frieza and King Cold cells, cells being is instantly evil and corrupt for approximately two-fifths, and explains why Cell was portrayed like he was, sinister, vicious, horrible, and a murderer. Now with Piccolo and Vegeta in the mix, they are characters who changed over time, but still had the memories of their darker hearts within. Therefore, those darker memories from the bad points in their life could easily add to the two-fifths of Cell, and he could potentially be three-fifths twisted and mean. But then we have to consider the good sides of Piccolo and Vegeta, and then finally the one-fifth being Goku Cells, meaning those mentalities and personalities are also what Cell's last two-fifths are compromised of. And this is what I feel gives Cell his more rational behavior when he's in his perfect form. Let's look at the major differences between Imperfect Cell and Perfect Cell in terms of his psychology. Before his perfect form, Cell had a desire, and he couldn't stop the lust for absorbing the androids and fulfilling his destiny. He was desperate, he was craving it, and he would do anything to get it. He was hungry for that power. And that's what ultimately drove Imperfect Cell and explains his horrible actions. When Cell became perfect, his mentality slightly changed. He had just achieved everything he longed for, and how did his psychology change initially? Well, he was no longer desperate. He no longer was ready to kill at will. He wasn't hungry for more power because he felt he had the power, and he was much more reserved, and all he wanted to do was test the power he had. He wanted to play games. He wanted to face the next challenge. He wanted to push his limits. Does this sound familiar to other fighters who compromises of the Cells inside? The design on paper by Dr. Jiro of having all of the greatest warriors and their strengths and abilities sounded unstoppable but really that combination of different dominant personalities and urges was ultimately Cell's biggest weakness. And that ultimately destroyed him because it's like his mentality was being dragged in so many different directions, causing problems for his decisions. Think about it. When he first fought Piccolo, he gave Piccolo tons of information. He didn't have to do that, but he's got Cells inside such as Frieza, Vegeta, and Goku, guys who run their mouth too damn much. And let's not forget, he spilled that information because he was overconfident and thought he won at that moment. Sounds like some of the fighters inside too. Next, when he became perfect, he fought Vegeta and Trunks as if they were there to test his power. His goal wasn't to go and murder people for no reason and get the fight over quick. He wanted to test his powers just like the dominant Saiyan cells inside him was urging him to. And this is further supported when he goes out of his way to create a tournament. And I feel this was definitely Goku and Piccolo cells inside that wanted to test the power in fair conditions, having the memories of the tournament, and mostly Goku and Vegeta's for having the lust for battle. However, it was Freezer's and his father's cells that made him want to destroy the Earth if the fighters lose the tournament. So you can see how there were so many different combinations of different mentalities working together. Let's be honest, if he just had Freezer cells, he would have killed Vegeta, killed Trunks right there and then, not given any chance chances then hunted the others down one by one but because of Goku cells it's almost like he had some sort of good spirit to make things exciting and have fun. It delayed the evil in his heart and this is further supported in the Cell games where he waits patiently for nearly 10 days. The cells of Goku, Piccolo, and maybe Vegeta held back the destruction of Earth long enough for Cell to get what he wanted, and that was to test his own power, to fuel the lust. And during the tournament, he was treating the battle fairly, for the most part, and wanted to really test his limits like Goku and Vegeta. And he offered Goku to get a Senzu bean, to which that was his arrogance inside him, which was probably from Vegeta. As Vegeta let Cell become perfect, that sort of mentality, it's like Cell inherited the risky decision making for the thrill of the battle. When Gohan didn't want to fight, Cell was motivated to see the new power of Gohan. Again, wanted to fuel his own desire to face strong opponents like Goku and Vegeta. In no way would Frieza and King Cole Cells ever want to encourage a stronger power to reveal itself. They didn't want a Super Saiyan to emerge, so obviously this lust to see Gohan's hidden power was coming from Goku and Vegeta's urges, but with the combination of Frieza and King Cole's horrible methods to get it done. The Cell Juniors was something I feel like Cell never needed to do either. He could have stormed that mountain himself and trashed everyone, but the Cell Juniors reminded me of the Cybermen introduction and how Vegeta saw things as a game. And I feel this is how Cell was treating it, like a bit of fun. There was no clear direction or straightforward mentality of Cell. His decisions were like a merry-go-round or wheel of fortune. You didn't know what was next. And it wasn't until Cell was really backed into a corner by Gohan that his mentality broke down and turned him into a shivering coward. Cell obtained his greatest power and was facing someone he couldn't overcome. He couldn't act arrogant anymore because he had nothing to fall back on power-wise. So instead, the desperation comes in and a Freezer-esque move begins. 
for self-destruction, to take Earth with him. This is something Freezer would do when backed into a corner, destroy everything if he can't win. But as soon as he came back as Super Perfect Cell, the arrogance returned because Cell felt he had control once again. Once Cell loses control, he turns into Freezer. When he has control, he's more or less like a Saiyan Saga Vegeta. The way he killed Trunks was something Freezer would have done though, but the fact he was egging Gohan to fight back for a brief time meant Cell was being cocky like Vegeta once again, but still had this notion to test his new super perfect power. And when Gohan backed down, Cell went for the decisive Kamehameha because he knew the Earth had nothing more to give. He was done with it. But all I have to say is thank goodness Gohan came to his senses and fought back, killing Cell entirely. The point of this video is, Cell had multiple chances throughout the entire saga to end things, but he didn't because he had flaws in his design due to his personalities clashing and affecting his decisions. I feel if Cell's design was less spaced out and had more specific personality types, then he would have been much more straightforward. But due to him having such different mentalities in his cells, it made him unpredictable, not just to others, but to himself also, and it was slowly building up the problems for him. I believe if there were no other challenges or goals for Cell to toy around with and test himself, his design would ultimately lead to him destroying himself in the end, because he would have nothing to live for except his own selfish desires, which is what most of his cells primarily make up of, selfish beings. Cell wanted adventure with his own power, and he had all the right tools and design to do anything he wanted, but he let himself get consumed by his own strengths. The King of the Demon Realm, thousands of years old, Babidi's right hand man, and the first real threat of the entire Majin Buu saga. I'm going to say right now, Dabura had the caliber in the looks department to be potentially the greatest villain in Dragon Ball history. Give him a giant sword, give him a cape for the Dracula look. The most alpha disgruntled voice in every universe that existed, owns his own demon realm, the villain who is stated to be stronger than Cell by Goku. This dude was a smart guy, well mannered, kind of reminded me of the Dooku type, and this guy was extremely loyal to Babidi despite the events of Majin Buu's hatching, but the Demon King has the balls to question Babidi if he needs to. This guy has the backbone to admit his mistakes, and he soon started giving advice to Babidi about Majin Buu needed to be stopped before he becomes out of control, and you know something? Dabura was right all along. He was the alpha concept of villains, but didn't have the right in to back him up. This guy was spooky, luring Gohan in to attack him, and when he roars when attacking you, and man, this moveset! He had so much unexplored potential with his dark magic, his demonic will to be explored, that separated him from other villains up until that point. He could have had some ultra demon form that made him look like the final boss Jekt from Final Fantasy X. And like I said, a sword? What's not to love about that? They could have had Dabura unlock stronger versions of the sword, Flame Sword, Dark Magic Blade. The biggest downfall of Dabura was indirectly caused by Majin Buu. It couldn't be helped. The arc was building up for Majin Buu. It's only fitting for the current villain Dabura to be squashed to put Majin Buu over. And that was part of the problem. First of all, Dabura didn't need to get killed off to put Buu over. And secondly, even if he was killed off, it should have never have been done in the way it was done. A complete insult and joke to an almighty demon king. Basically, they had a concept of this Demon King, and they basically pissed on it to make Majin Buu look really strong. But Buu was already strong anyway, and could already prove himself against Gohan, Vegeta, and the Supreme Kai. He could have gone out in a blaze of glory like the Demon King that he was supposed to be, showcasing his true evil dormant power. But nope, they turned him into a cookie, basically erasing all of the seriousness of Dabura we got up until that point. It was a complete mockery. Sure, there's only room for one big villain. Even if it was a squash match, cut his damn head off or something like you see in gritty war films or battles, but a cookie? We don't need you now, we have a better, stronger villain, bye bye. And just like that, they tried to find a quick way to get rid of him. And to me personally, to have Dabura just get eliminated like that, makes me think why the hell did they bring him in in the first place? They could have used some other chump to fill his place and get beat, because all he did to advance the plot was detect Vegeta's weakness to get him to turn. He had all those qualities to be vital to this arc if he was pushed in that direction. Who doesn't love a Demon King veteran? We could have had Dabura get smashed down then later recover and actually, with a massive twist, side with the good guys in a desperate struggle to fight Boo because they're on common ground. Imagine Vegeta and Dabura versus Boo. Of course the result would have still been the same, but the chemistry and interest in dialogue we could have had would have been pretty cool. But then imagine we got an angry Piccolo who stood up for himself and regained his dignity in the Buu saga because Piccolo was a joke back then. But imagine he wanted to prove himself against Dabura. Imagine Piccolo hit the time chamber for one year, came out and squared off against Dabura later down the line to reclaim his honor. Demon versus Demon King. Heck, even have Dabura bring in his dark army to get revenge on Babidi and Boo. That would have been kind of cool stuff to see as well. But no, what do we get? Dabura in heaven filled with joy and love. 
And that was the icing on the cake for me. If being a cookie wasn't enough, let's take away his evil once and for all and make him mingle with the wives and girlfriends. I see the comedy aspect to it and the fact that Buru would have liked hell, but still, it was the execution of wasting a good concept. As much as I like Boo, by having the decision to have Boo make a joke out of a serious Dabura type character, that really showed us what direction the whole Boo arc was going in. And that was a wacky, jokey, Super Saiyan bargain roller coaster ride. First of all, let's look at the villains of Dragon Ball Z up until the Boo Saga. We have Saiyans, the Tyrant Freezer and his army, the androids, which include the biological android Cell, who compromised of the previous villains before this time. When we look at the type of characters those are, we basically have space warriors and tyrants, followed by a theme of science in the creation of the androids. In none of those arcs, were there any elements of magic in relation to the villains? So when Majin Buu was introduced, this was being based on magic and mystical elements. And this is one of the reasons to me why Majin Buu as a villain stands out as a unique villain for the right reasons, the theme behind his creation. We get a villain with a lot of backstory going back millions of years. And by the time he becomes Super Buu and Kid Buu, we have a villain who basically lives to stomp on people's faces. That is like what he only thinks about when eating his Cheerios in the morning. Just a complete maniac. And when we think about it, sometimes Times the basic concepts work in Dragon Ball. The motives of Majin Buu, the pure Buu we should say, were very basic. Destroy. Now let's talk about the build up to Buu, the first appearance. Now the build up was powerful and exciting, think about it. The fight in stages on Babidi's ship, the introduction of the Supreme Kai to stop Buu being hatched. But focusing on Buu here, when he arrived, after all that build up, man, were there twists and turns. Instead of seeing this massive scary looking brute that we envisioned, we get a chubby pink blob who you wouldn't think is a serious villain. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but this gave me the memories of when Frieza hit his final form. Everyone thought he would become something bigger and scarier looking, but nope, the surprise. He's smaller, sleek and slender. And that big fat surprise of Boo kind of worked for all the wrong reasons. Hear me out here. The fact he was a big lump, acting like a child, but had a lot of this evil power within, and was literally going to eat you alive, was, if I may, goddamn terrifying. Think about it. When Vegeta was fighting for his life against this evil thing, Boo was just walking towards him, humming a tune and wanted to kill, and reminded me of some creepy horror movie with a cute looking doll with a knife or something like that. The fact we are Super Saiyan 2 warriors with all our pride and seriousness, having a fat child with almost unlimited power sit on you, laughing and punch your face in, not caring he's caving your Super Saiyan skull in so you can't go home to your wife or child is actually frightening. Think about it. So I defend Majin Buu for this appearance. The out of the box appearance on his first arrival. It was different and set it apart from the other villains. We really didn't have any fat villains before this. Serious villains, not like Dodoria. Unless we count Cell exploding. So Buu's appearance wins here in terms of uniqueness from the previous. And he's pink. How can we not love that? Totally separates him from the big main villains. Now in terms of his abilities, regeneration, okay, we had this with Cell, but if I'm honest, seeing the regen on Boo works so much better and with more of a fluid nature. He's a goddamn bubblegum and the pink regen looks neat, but his abilities, turning his enemies into food, again, is terrifying because it makes a mockery out of the opponent as well. Think about it, Boo could waste you with his raw power alone, but the fact he takes away your dignity with a candy bar move is devastating to a warrior's legacy and pride. He's not like Cell or Freezer in that he just wants to assert his dominance. Boo is a whack job, and he'll do things at random. He is literally like the Joker, but with a ton of power. And that moveset, along with his freestyle limb attacks, flexible nature, and orthodox fighting mechanics, being a rolling ball, and the ability to learn opponent's attacks in seconds just showcase that this magical villain, this magical Jin, is different from the others up until now. It's almost like Toriyama thought, what haven't we done with a villain up until this far? Okay, let's just cram it all into Boo. The absorption was actually deadly. It could catch you off guard if you weren't careful. It added a new dynamic to the battle. If you take your eyes off Boo, your power becomes his. You couldn't breathe against this guy, especially with his stamina levels. So we get to his forms and his progressive growth. We could say this is similar to Cell, but I totally feel Boo's growth was a bit more of a wacky roller coaster and more interesting and unpredictable. With Cell, we knew he had to absorb the androids, and we knew he was going to evolve and had an expectation of his power increase. But Boo, we didn't know what the hell was going on each time he absorbed somebody or transformed. Fat Boo splits into Evil Boo, then Super Boo, then various absorptions of Super Boo, including the unexpected absorption of Gotenks, Piccolo and Gohan, and finally, the totally unexpected Kid Boo, which even Goku and Vegeta were shocked at. Each transformation totally took us by surprise, adding the magical feel to this beast, not to mention Boo's previous jacked forms in the days of the Kai battles. We didn't know if Boo was going to get weaker or stronger depending on who he absorbed, as shown with some of the Kais by gaining somewhat of a kinder heart, and of course with Gotenks and the fusion wearing off. And each form had its own unique moveset, from Galactic Donuts to Genocide Blast to the Destruction Ball. Boo had a variety of forms, 
to keep any fan interested, I'm pretty sure every Dragon Ball fan has a favorite form of Boo, no matter if they disliked him as a whole. In terms of his allegiance, it was mostly chaotic. But the fact Boo absorbed a number of characters changed his chaotic levels. This nerfed the insanity of the original Kid Boo. But seeing that bond with Boo and Mr. Satan was also impactful, especially when Boo became Super Boo. There was still an ounce of care for Mr. Satan, even in that horrendously scary Boo. To the point even Videl was used as a reason to give Piccolo and the boys time to prepare. Super Boo listened. Little elements like that added something interesting to a straightforward evil character. But being evil wasn't just it. Boo also enjoyed lots of fun in form of fighting people as strong as him, and would get very bored if there was nothing challenging. Thus, when Super Saiyan 3 hit the scene, Fat Boo was actually having fun. And of course, Super Boo had the goal of testing out Gotenks and of course Gohan. But when it came to Kid Boo, there was no mercy. This guy was just wild. It's like, right guys, the time is over. Let's end this. He just wanted to hurt people and laugh at it. But when we think about it, the dude, as evil as he was, had some pretty solid comedy moments as well. I also like how the evil Boo looked menacing, showcasing the evil inside Boo. Each Boo expressed how he was going to fight. I preferred Super Boo, he was my favorite, like an adult version of Kid Boo. A little less chaotic, but still had that potential to be super evil. But because of that, he was more frightening because he would let that fear build up inside you first. He knew what the hell he was doing. Think about how much Majin Buu has made the heroes suffer both mentally and physically from the start to the end of the Buu saga. The thought that Gohan was dead, Vegeta dying, the pain everyone experienced, killing nearly everyone on Earth, turning Chi Chi into an egg in front of Goten, torturing Gohan after taking his little brother a mentor, playing little mind games, and just finally obliterating the Earth. That's a horrible being. If you think about it, he actually carried out what a villain was meant to do in Dragon Ball all along. He is all about actions rather than talk, and I can respect that. The decades-old war between the strongest Majin Buu seems to have come to a solid close. Think again! After the Dragon Ball Z anime producer and lead screenwriter Takeo Kayama made an interesting post about the Majin on Twitter recently, the Dragon Ball fandom goes even further beyond in the chaotic Kid Buu vs. Buhan war. But what really is the truth behind what he said, and how does it affect the manga and the Z anime, and all other statements? Let's break this down and put together everything we've got to come to a reasonable conclusion. Takeo was asked which Majin Buu is the most powerful, and he said Majin Buu Boo who absorbed ultimate Gohan will be the strongest. This was further translated to him saying, perhaps the strongest. Then all of a sudden he makes a further tweet saying, I just muttered that Gohan Buu would be the strongest among the transformation forms of Majin Buu. You could easily argue that Kid Buu is not a transformation form of Majin Buu. So maybe he's not considering Kid Buu when he's given his view on the strongest Buu. Kid Buu is pure Buu. He's just himself not transformed. Either way, I want you to remember this. Takeo is the guy who literally said Z Broly can solo the entire Z villain cast. So before you take his word as God's word, do think about everything as a whole first. Because there is a roadblock you will hit even with these tweets. In the Z anime, Kid Buu is the strongest. And that's what a lot of fans are ignoring. The Z anime is one continuity. The manga is one continuity. Things happen in the Z anime that don't happen in the Z manga. Things happen in the movies that don't happen in the series or manga. These are different continuities of Dragon Ball that have their own stories and also follow similar plot points. Even if he is the lead screenwriter for the Z anime, it doesn't erase the fact Kid Buu was stated to be the strongest and stated multiple times in the actual show itself. That's core evidence because it was actually produced and authorized in the actual show. What you watch and read, that is the evidence. And it wasn't stated just once, but multiple times in the show. If Takeo is the big boss for the Z anime, why was that information authorized for the Z anime for Kid Buu to be the strongest? Think about that. Either he agreed or someone else more powerful than him authorized it. So either way you want to cut the cake, no matter what's been said nearly 30 years later, Kid Buu is the strongest Buu in the Z anime. That was the intention at the time. That's what was produced. That's what we've consumed for nearly 30 years. If you want to retcon it, Go ahead, but you'll have to create a new show. And that's what a lot of fans are misunderstanding. Not in the Z anime. Due to the way the plot and statements work. You cannot change what's been consumed over 30 years. The original Z anime is never going away. And every time you watch it, it will say 
Kid Buu is the strongest. That is the story that's going on. Along with an interview with Akira Toriyama, implying Kid Buu is the strongest by concept, not correcting the interviewer's interpretation of Kid Buu being the strongest too, plus tons of material and sources implying Kid Buu is the strongest for that extra support if you want it. This really is a never-ending war, but as long as you know which Buu is the strongest in certain continuities, you don't have to have a war. Does it make sense Kid Buu is the strongest in the Z anime? No. Kid Buu being the strongest in any continuity is ridiculous. But the Z anime states otherwise, and plot convenient power ups are enough to cause headaches for us all. But they do happen, and we can't justify or make sense of them. They just happen. There are such things as inconsistencies and bad writing. You can make retcons and tweets all you want. Bad, senseless writing can still exist. You can't invalidate it just because it's bad. Look at it like this If I made you a lemon cheesecake 30 years ago, and when you ate it, it was actually strawberry cheesecake, just because now, 30 years later, I said, perhaps it's lemon cheesecake cake doesn't change what you consumed or what actually happened. I agree feats are very important engaging characters and they help us understand where the characters are. Buhan performed the feat, Kid Buu didn't, I understand that, but characters who are assumed stronger after a certain point, after certain characters, through the dialogue, through the story, they don't need to perform those feats anymore. For example, Super Saiyan Rage Trunks in the Super Anime is far stronger than Super Saiyan God in Battle of Gods. Trunks never produced shockwaves like Goku, but we know through dialogue, story and scaling, that he is more than capable of that level of power. So for Buan to be greater than Kid Buu in the Z anime, the feat argument is irrelevant here due to multiple statements of Kid Buu surpassing all Buu's before. He's capable in a power sense. Now with the supported power scaling, I cannot argue with you. It makes perfect sense Buhan is the strongest through scaling. But in the Z anime? There is something called plot convenient power-ups. Even in Dragon Ball Super, Kaioken Goku took on Merge Zamasu alone and overpowered him after fusion. That's a plot convenient power-up that makes absolutely no sense, but we consider it and apply headcanon for Goku's growth after fusion. Things just happen. Yes, Takeo is the lead screenwriter. He said Buan is the strongest overall, but did he clarify anime or manga? No. Has he responded to the Kid Buu statements? No. This is 30 years later. The product has been out that long. It would go against the intentions at the time. Whoever put that dialogue in the final product obviously has more ground and rank to do so. Toriyama's interview, yes, it would be incredibly unfair to discredit this, but credit to Keio instead. That would be insanely biased, and it would be insanely biased to assume he's only talking about Frieza because there was a picture of Frieza on the page, but there's clearly no other space to fit other characters. And this is first form Frieza. He's not even the strongest Frieza. That would be terrible to assume that. Furthermore, the interviewer brought up Boo being the strongest. Toriyama responded as whole and answered the question without any correction of that question. This is a solid piece that shows intention of the character of Kid Boo and his power, plus him being the final boss. And it supports it even more in the Z anime. If we say something like Toriyama only meant Freezer, then I can definitely say Takeo only meant the manga in his tweet. That's how unfair that is. The good thing is we have both. We have multiple continuities. The Z anime is set in stone though. Badly written statements and inconsistencies, but there you go. It definitely adds ground for Buan being the strongest overall where it's implied. But not in the Z anime. And maybe you could invalidate one statement or dismiss it in error, but Multiple statements, multiple times? No, it's set in stone in the Z anime. No matter what someone says, no matter if it's Akira Toriyama, it doesn't change what's happened in the actual show 30 years ago. Maybe this opens up for the retcon of Kid Buu being the strongest because he had God Key, but didn't know how to use it. The champion is Kid Buu for the Z anime. And if you base any videos off the Z anime, you can definitely use Kid Buu as the strongest Buu. But even with Takeo's tweets, nothing has changed. Kid Buu is a goddamn strawberry cheesecake.